Welcome to the preaching ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. Pastor Baker is fulfilling the call of God on his life to preach the truth of God's Word without compromise, raising up disciples who through faith in God will have a powerful impact on our world. May you be blessed and refreshed through the message that Pastor Baker has to share with you today. May God's very best be yours. I'm excited to be here. You know, um, your pastor is awesome. He is. Go ahead and be seated. You know why your pastor is awesome? I'm going to brag about him. He's going to be mad for a minute. But you know why he's awesome? Because what you don't get to see, I get to see. And see, one of the things that he is, is a man that practices what he preaches. Amen. How many of that have you have, have ever heard him say, you need to tithe? Yes. Yeah. How many say you need to give into your church? Yeah. Right? Well, <laughs> you said that too? Uh, every Sunday. Oh, every Sunday he says it. Well, did you know that your pastor's a tither and he's a giver to his pastor? I know because I've seen it. See, you don't get to see it, but I get to see it. He, he, he practices what he preached. Both his, uh, him and Miss Kathy are both very, very strong on practicing what they preach. And that's pretty good, isn't it? And I wanted to brag for a minute because, you know, you don't get to see that, but I do, and, and uh, I get to see him honor my father, who is his pastor, and so um, it's, it's a pretty awesome thing, isn't it? Isn't it great to have a good pastor, still loves Jesus, still allows Jesus to be in the church, still allows the Holy Ghost to be here? You know, there's a lot of churches that the Holy Ghost isn't welcome, but I'm glad that this church pastor that you haven't given up and, and hid the Holy Spirit in the back room somewhere, so amen. Open your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Kings chapter 19. Yeah. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 19. You can catch up to me. It says, So he departed from there and found Elisha, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the twelve. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. Verse 20, he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and mother, and I will follow you. But he said to him, Go back, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him, took the yoke of oxen, slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment, gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Became a servant. Now, this is one of my absolute favorite scriptures in the Bible. And the reason why is because the prophet or the man of God was walking by and his anointing was so strong that it got off on a person working in a field. That's what it means when his mantle was thrown off of him. So here's a man out working in the field, plowing the field, all of a sudden goes, whoa, what was that? And sees a man of God walking by, goes running after him saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Then he followed Elijah and became his servant. Not his youth pastor, not his, not his assistant, not his preacher, not his peer. He became his servant. Amen. You know what else I like about this is he went and he got rid of everything he owned. To help preach the gospel. He got rid of everything. He, he, he not only killed the oxen, he used the equipment to boil it and to give it away. That's pretty awesome. Flip over to 2 Kings chapter 2. See, we got to be servants found working. That's how Elisha was found. He was found working. He was found doing something with his hands. Wasn't, wasn't found on his knees before God. Wasn't found at the altar, his hands raised, looking good, going through all the motions. He was found working. I'll guarantee he was sweating. Second Kings chapter two. 
And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went to Elisha. And Elisha, Elijah said to Elisha, stay here for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha says, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. In verse four, he says, Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here again for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Then Elijah said to him again in verse 6, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me on to Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. Man, have I, how many times have you heard that, Pastor? <laughs> I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while two of them stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was when they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, what can I do for you before I'm taken away? And Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Man, Elisha didn't want anything but the man's anointing. Isn't that amazing? I mean, he said, stay here in this city. I'll, I mean, look at all we've done. We built this great ministry. You stay here. You run it. It'll be your ministry. I'm going to move on. And he said, no, I don't want that. I want that. And he went to the next city and he went to the third city and the same thing. And he said, no, I want that anointing. So then finally, the man of God says, what do you want from me? Well, I want your anointing. I love this part right here. Verse 10, he says, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Now, why would he say such a thing, you think? I mean, didn't he prove that he went from one city to the next? I mean, three times over years time, he he proven he had proven to, it, to his man of God that he is not going anywhere. But he said, still, buckaroo, if you're still around, if you're still here, if you're still chasing the anointing and not everything else, then and only then will you have it. Then they continued on and talked, and suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to a whirl in, by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and his horsemen. And he saw him no more. He took a hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. Then he went and took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. Then he took the mantle that had fallen and struck the water and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had done that, it had divided again and Elisha crossed over on dry land. I mean, the only thing that this man wanted was a double portion. He didn't want the ministries. He was chasing after the anointing. <coughs> That's the way we need to be. Amen. We need to not care about the chairs or the carpet or the, the, the room or the, the worship team or what pastor looks like or Miss Kathy looks like because that none of that matters. What matters is the anointing of Jesus Christ that is on the man and woman of God to help you. Amen. To take care of you. God called somebody to do nothing but worry about us. Pray for us. Right? How many have the word on how to fix themselves? Anybody have that? Well, there's a man in the room that has the word. When you go to the doctor to get fixed, do you say, well, I don't know if you know what you're talking about, doctor. I better look at your credentials and make sure that you got, you know, you went to a good school. No, you take that little, per, that little piece of paper and you run it down to the pharmacy and you fill it. And most of you, if you're like me, don't even read what it is. The doctor said to take it, therefore I'm going to take it. 
But isn't it amazing that all of a sudden when pastor gives us a little piece of paper with instructions on what to do, now we're going to read it. Now we're going to challenge it. Now we're going to say, hmm, I think pastor, he might have missed it on this one. I'm not sure he's talking about me. This must have been for the person I sat next to tonight. Come on, how many have said that? That message isn't for me. <laughs> that message must have been for somebody else tonight. No, we have, to be, we have to be drawing on the anointing that's on our pastor. You know, you can open that Bible that's sitting in front of you and you can look at every single page and there isn't one page on there that you're going to find that says it's pastor's job to make sure he preaches good. No, you're not going to find one on there. You can, I mean, if pastor gets up and you didn't like what he said or you thought he did a horrible job, it's not his fault. It's yours. Don't throw anything at me yet. Let me explain it to you first. You can read all over the Bible where it talks about pulling on the anointing of God. If pastor's message wasn't good, it's because you weren't pulling on that anointing. Plus, how many trust that your pastor is led by God? Yes. Okay, well, that's pretty unanimous. How many think that when he prepares a message, that he gets on his face before God to prepare that message? Okay, that's pretty much everybody. So if he gets on it, if you trust him, that he got on his face before God to, to gather a message from you, then we all could say that his message came from God. Can we all say that? Yeah. So if you don't like his message, why are you mad at pastor? That's right. <laughs> if you're mad at what he's preaching, you need to get before God and say, I don't like what my pastor's preaching. The message didn't come from him. Don't be mad at the messenger. Be mad at the man that sent the message down. Yeah. Come on. I'm preaching pretty good. All he wanted was a double portion of the man's spirit. Chasing after a spirit. How many people do you know that chased after something that wasn't a spirit? Maybe a building or popularity or fame or the bathrooms were nicer or come on. If your pastor is not demanding the impossible out of you, then you're not doing your job. You're not drawing on him. The messages should be harder and harder. Every time he gets to the platform, he should be just getting everything out, of it, chiseling every little thing. When pastor gets up, he's getting up and he's chiseling that out right there. And then he says, no, you're not level, so you need to go that way a little bit. That's what his job is. Right? To mold us and to shape us and to, to put us into where we need to be. Amen. You know what else I, I was reading the other day, Pastor? A new scripture that they just put in the Bible <laughs> that says it's your responsibility to fill the chairs. Uh, <laughs> no. I ain't found that verse. <laughs> That's funny because I haven't found it either. <laughs> you know why it's not there? Because it's not his job. It's not pastor's job to fill this. There's a seat empty next to you because you didn't fill it. Plain and simple. You can be mad at me. You can, you can frown at me. But plain and simple, the chair next to you is empty because you didn't bring somebody to church. Now, I don't know what your Bible says, but my Bible says, and even in my electronic version, which pretty much has like 40 versions, all the versions that I read, Mark 16, 15 says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. It doesn't say pastor goes into all the world. It says you go into all the world and preach the gospel. Amen. It also says in there in the New Testament where Jesus commanded us to go out into the highways and the byways and compel people to come. Now, let me know what the word compel means. The word compel is not, Miss Kathy, will you go to church with me today? Oh, you won't? Okay. 
No, compel is, Miss Kathy, you going to come to church with me today? No? All right. Tomorrow, I'm going to be, it's churches tomorrow. I'm going to be in your driveway and I'm going to beep the horn and I'm going to ring the doorbell. And if you don't come out, I'm going to wait a few minutes and then Sunday night we have church too. So if you couldn't get out of bed Sunday morning, I'll be in your driveway Sunday night. Church starts at 6. We got to be there for prayer. Do you have prayer? Five. Got to 5 o'clock. We got to be there at 5. So I'll be at your house at 445 and I'm just going to lay on the horn until you come out. <laughs> and if you don't come out, all your neighbors are going to come out. And then when they don't come out, you show up Wednesday night and you do the same thing. And you show up Sunday morning the next time and the next Sunday night. And eventually you will compel them to come. That's right. That's good. Yeah. right? That's what compel means. Yep. To help motivate them. Mm -hmm. Compel them to come. Compel them. We need to be led by the Spirit. You know how many people are ready for Jesus that, you, that are around you every day? There are so many people in your life that are ready to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. They just need somebody like you to be bold. Somebody like you to step up and say, I will do it. I'll take on the challenge. I just did a youth camp with a couple hundred youth and what I did, my main thing yesterday was the little song we used to sing like, that's this little light of mine. And they all sang it and it was fun, but there's so much truth into this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Now, I don't drink Starbucks. My Starbucks is a little place on the corner on my way to work called Speedway. It's a gas station and my Starbucks is a, a, a 44 ounce Dr. Pepper. Now it's full of ice. Quit looking at me like that. It's full of ice. So it's really only like 20 ounces of liquid. So it's the same amount as your cappuccinos and all of that. So quit, quit giving me the evil eye, all of you healthy people. But that's what I do on the way to work every single day when I'm in town. And uh, I go in there and, and um, just a, a few months ago, um, one of the, the ladies that have been working there for, you know, probably 10 years, uh, it seems like. And um, I, I went in and she was like, why are you always so happy? And I, I said, well, I didn't really know I was always happy. I'm like, why, what, what do you mean? She said, you come in here almost every single day. Sometimes more, because that's our convenience store. So if you need milk or you need something quick, that's where I go. So I'm in there a lot. And uh, she said, you always come in, no matter what, you always come in and you're always whistling something. Or you're always humming something. She said, I want to know why you're so happy all the time. And I said, well, I'm glad you asked. And I said, I'm sorry, actually. I apologize to you right now that you had to ask. And she said, well, what do you mean? You're apologizing to me? And I said, yeah. I said, I apologize that you had to ask why I'm so happy. I said, I'm happy because Jesus lives inside of me. She said, really? I said, I suppose you're going to invite me out to your church then. And I said, no, I'm not going to invite you to my church. <laughs> and she said, well, why not? And I said, because all the people at our church are happy and you're not happy. <laughs> And she said, well, wait a minute. She was a little older lady. And she said, no, wait a minute. Does that mean that I can't come to your church? And I said, if you smile, you can come to our church. I said, but you know what's more important, ma'am? More important than you come into our church is that you know Jesus. You're more than welcome to come to our church anytime you want. I'm just teasing you. But it's not about coming to our church. It's about you having a relationship with Amen. Jesus. And you know what's awesome? As I planted that seed, yes. there were so many people in the store. She was busy. I didn't have, you know, we didn't have the time. She got distracted and moved on. I didn't have the time. But you know what I did? I went to a couple of the ladies in our church. And I said, you know, that lady up there at the corner store, you know, we live in a small town. So it's not, uh, it's not like we have a hundred convenience stores. But uh, I said, that little lady up there, she's ready. 
She's ready. She's, she just needs the right person at the right time. And I said, I've been planting little seeds in her and I didn't even know it. But I said, I planted the biggest one. I put it in there and I watered it. And now somebody needs to go in there. Would you believe, Miss Kathy, after a few weeks, one of those ladies went in and, you know, going in and out. They got her saved. Amen. They got her in a church. She doesn't go to our church, but she goes to another church in town that, you know, she'll eventually be at our church. But we know she can't handle our church. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Baby steps. <laughs> but she's in church. You know, it's those little seeds that we plant, the little seeds, all because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't like I was going in purposely to let my light shine. My light was just shining. Amen. I didn't even know it. About, uh, about a month ago at the same place, I ran into a, a little nun. She was about this, this tall and probably about 80 85 years old, poor thing was driving and shouldn't have been, <laughs> but she was, and uh, she was inside there and, and she was getting a drink too. And I got a drink and she was looking around. I could tell she was looking for a straw. Well, I know where they're at. Cause you know, I'm in there <laughs> every once in a while. And so I pulled a straw out and I handed it to her and uh, she, you know, took it and I got my stuff together. And I started to walk away and she said, you're a Christian, aren't you? And I said, well, maybe. I said, why do you want to know? She said, I could just tell. I said, what do you mean you could tell? I didn't say anything. I didn't even say anything when I handed it to her. The thing, she said, thank you. And I said, yes, ma'am. And that was it. So I said, what do you mean I'm a Christian? She said, I could tell because there's a glow about you. Amen. And I said, really, there's a glow about me? You know, I wasn't trying, I'm a pastor, I wasn't, I'm not bragging about me because I was in there, you know, praying in tongues with a cross on my shirt that says, ask me about Jesus. <laughs> I just went in there to get my, and quite honest, I didn't even want to stop. I'm sure I was in a hurry because I'm in a hurry everywhere I go. So I'm sure I was in a hurry. I didn't even want to get stopped. But she said, there's a glow about you. She said, where do you go to church? I said, well, I go to that church out on Stark Road. I'm one of the pastors there. And she said, oh, that church. <laughs> well, now, now she's got my attention. I said, what do you mean, that church? She said, well, that church out there, that preacher preaches about prosperity. And I said, you know what? He does. She said, well, Jesus didn't preach about prosperity. And I said, well, I think you're wrong. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh, really? <laughs> she said, well, he gave everything to the poor. So how could he have been prosperous? I said, I think, I think you're looking at the word prosperity as in money. I said, how do you know that Jesus wasn't prosperous in health? And wanted everybody to be healthy. Didn't he go around laying hands on the sick? Almost everywhere he went. He wanted to put prosperity in life. Right? Didn't he bring people back from the dead? Obviously he wanted people to live. But I said more importantly, don't, don't you know that he rode on the finest donkey with the finest things wrapped over it because somebody gave him the finest thing out there? I said, that'd be like driving a Lamborghini or a Ferrari. Yeah. I said, Jesus drove a Ferrari. And she said, hmm, I'm going to have to go study that. <laughs> what are you saying, Josh? What I'm saying is that I walked into that place not trying to let my light shine. I didn't purpose to let my light shine. I didn't purpose to talk to somebody about Jesus. Just a glow was on me because Jesus lives inside of me. That's the way you need to be. Let that light shine so everybody can see it. Amen. You need to find the person that's right for Jesus. One of the scriptures in the Bible says to throw in the sickle to find which, th which thing is ripe for him. Which thing is ripe and ready. There's so, much, so many thing, people ready to be harvested into God's 
thing. If we would just ask him, Lord, show me. When you're going into the grocery store, if you'd say, Lord, if there's anybody in this grocery store that is ready for you or needs a touch from you, make my cart bump into them. Don't you think Jesus can do that? Yeah. Can you imagine just going down and all of a sudden your car goes thunk? Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Oh, you look like you're having a bad day. Can I pray for you? You know what the most powerful witnessing tool in the planet is this right here. Did you know that? This right here. You know why? Can I pray for you? Oh, man, you've got them. They're not going anywhere. I mean, unless they do one of these things and pull away, you've got them. Right. Even a tough guy like this, he's going to it's it's going to be purposeful for him to peel away from me. Yeah. You got him right here. One of my favorite things is to find somebody that's having a bad day and do this right here. Can I pray for you? Hardly anybody says no. Amen. Just even out of courtesy, they might be the roughest person in the world. They might just be so mad that you even bumped into them. But even the meanest, roughest person hardly ever says no. Amen. And then what you do is you pray the best prayer you've ever prayed. I call it the 10 second prayer. Oh, Lord. Right in this hand is a sinner going to hell. <laughs> they're having a bad day because they're not going to make heaven, Jesus. But could you just give them enough mercy and enough grace to save them and heal them and fix them and whatever their problem is right now? You know what that is? That's boldness. Yeah. What do you got to lose? You didn't even know who they were. <laughs> huh? See, so many people are, are embarrassed. Now, we have, we have interns that come into our ministry, and one of the biggest things, Pastor, that we do with those interns is teach them how to soul win. And one of the things that they hate the most is called door-to-door. -door. They go door-to-door -door every single week and knock on hundreds of homes to just pray for people. We don't invite them to our church. We don't, we don't you know, we just pray for them. Is there something I can pray for you today? And so many times they end up leading people to Jesus through prayer because there are actual people that care about them. Yeah. Yeah. Last Sunday, our group went out, Pastor, and they, they led like three people to the Lord because while they were praying for him for some situation, one lost a, a, a spouse like three or four weeks ago. And just they said, can we just pray for you for strength that you'll get through this and that that God will help you and God will save you from this. And they just these young kids just started praying for him. And he started crying and they said, you know what you need? You need Jesus. And he said, you're right, I do. And gave in right there. See, you get in the door by asking Jesus to call down his power. One of the things that I teach young people all the time is don't argue doctrine because you can't win. Just as much as you believe in Jesus Christ, they believe in Muhammad. Just like you're, they're not going to convince you there's no Jesus Christ, you're not going to convince them by words that there's a, that, you know, there's... Mohammed or something. You're just not going to do it. I have a saying that says, never argue with an idiot because they'll bring you down to their level and beat you through experience. Amen. They're experienced at being dumb. You're not going to win. You can open up all the stuff. You can show them all the stuff. And all you have is an argument. I remember being on the aircraft with my father one time and we were flying I think to Australia or something and uh, my dad you know was getting his notes together and his his Bible was out and all of his notes are sitting there and uh, we could tell the guy across the aisle kept looking over like he kept looking over at my dad's Bible about 30 minutes into it he says is that a Bible <laughs> my dad said well yeah yeah it is he said I suppose you believe in Jesus my dad said well Yep, I sure do. He said, well, I don't. I believe in whatever. I think he was Hindu or something. And, and my dad said, really? He said, you believe in a dead God, huh? He said, well, what do you mean my God's dead? He said, well, my God's alive, but your God, uh, everything I read, including your own stuff, it says your God is dead. 
So they started kind of not arguing, but, you know, debating back and forth. And my dad said, you know what? Hold on a second. Let's do this. Let's both bow our heads right now. Okay? Let's grab hands. And you pray the best prayer you have ever prayed to your God. I'll even join in with you and I'll give you the benefit of the doubt that your God is real. So let's bow our heads together and you just pray the best prayer. You ask your God to just come and visit us and come in and, you know, prove that he is God. And so my dad bowed his head and I'm sitting there. I'm, you know, I was like a teenager. I'm like, you know, looking out the window like fire is about ready to come through the cabin and fires and airplanes don't match. And so he, they started praying and he, I mean, he prayed good. He had a good prayer. He prayed to whatever God and, you know, did all of his little movements and, you know, shook and, and all of this stuff. And my dad's just there and he's peeking up at him every once in a while. And, and then all of a sudden it's quiet and I could just see my dad, you know, he's looking around. He looks at him and he goes, that's it? That's all you got? He said, yeah, that's all I got. And he said, Okay. Well, I didn't feel anything. Did you feel something? No, no, I didn't. Are you sure? Because I don't, if I missed it, we might need to start over again. He said, no, 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 no. He said, okay, now I'm going to pray to my God. And he grabbed his hands and he said, Lord Jesus, come show up right now and show this man that you are real. Tears started going down his face. My dad looked over at him and said, do you feel him? And he said, I feel him. You win. Yeah. Hey. They led him to the Lord right there on an aircraft. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because he asked Jesus to show up. Yes. Can you imagine if we asked Jesus to show up? To just come and be here and be with us? Imagine going to the gas station and just not only pumping gas, but say, Lord, I'm getting ready to go get gas. Let me pull up to the pump next to somebody that needs it. Imagine just taking five seconds and say, I, pulling in, saying, put me, to, put me in the right spot, Jesus. Yeah. And you pull up there and you start pumping your gas and you're looking around. Right? Looking for somebody that's ready. Somebody that could, even if it's just a seed planted. That's all you need to plant a seed inside of there. Plant a seed. You're not going to get everybody saved on the first round. Some people are, are tough ground. It's going to take a little bit to get the rake out and get, find some good soil. And then you plant that seed and then you're going to have to come back and water it and water it and water it. We started a campaign, Pastor, about three or four months ago, our church and our interns and outreach teams called We Love the City. And all, we have shirts and all kinds of stuff that just says we love this city. And we did an outreach uh, last month. We did an outreach in our park called Movie in the Park. We rented a movie and put a big screen up and handed out free hot dogs and popcorn and everything. And um, it was awesome. We had, you know, about five or six hundred people stop by. Only about a hundred of them were our church family. So it was it was awesome. We went through the parks and everything. And um, everybody kept asking, well, what is this for? And I ran into this one couple that, uh, that came by and they said, you're giving away free hot dogs? I'm like, yeah, you better hurry up and get over there and get some because they're running out. And she said, uh, the, the wife said, well, what is this for? And I said, well, we just want to bless the city here. We love this city. We've been here, you know, I've been here my whole life and, and uh, we're just... Just really want this city to be a blessed city. We're tired of people going out of jobs and everything. And she said, well, that's awesome, but why are you doing this? <laughs> so I was like, well, I guess we're just doing this because we love this city. And, and I go through my whole spiel again. And the, the husband stops me and says, well, you said all of that, but why are you doing this? And I'm like... Okay, I'm failing to communicate here. I really am. I'm digging hard. I thought I was a pretty good communicator. And I said, well, to be honest with you, you know, we're a, we're a church. And he's like, oh. <laughs> and I said, but honestly, we're just here because we love the city. I said, you know, somebody might invite you to church, but that's not what this event is about. And he said, what? I said, well, this, this event wasn't about 
getting you to come to our church. I said, you can actually look around and I don't think you'll really even see a sign that says Living Word Church. You know, I mean, we've got some great people here. I'm, I'm sure they love our church and might tell you about them. But, you know, it's really more about, you know, just loving this city and, and sharing the gospel of Jesus to you. And, uh, and they, they, they said, I, I don't understand. And I said, I'm not sure what, what there is to understand. I said, we love this city. Now go get a hot dog. <laughs> But they could, they could not understand, Pastor, that we would not, that we weren't there to just get them into our church. You know, that's not what it's about. Now, there are times that that's, we got to do that to go tell people and tell them about our church and stuff. But winning souls has to be more than rear ends and chairs. God commissioned us to go into all the world and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to every living creature. Amen. Turn over to Luke chapter 4 and verse 14. It says, Then Jesus returned in power, 414, of the Spirit of Galilee, and the news of him went out through the surrounding region, and he taught their synagogues, being glorified by all. There has to be a, that word news is like the same word as fame. There has to be a fame about your preacher that goes around in this area that draws people to come here. They're not going to come here because of you. They're not going to come here just because of Jesus. They're going to come here because you have talked about the love that is here with your pastor. Just like Jesus, he returned to, the, to, to Galilee and the news of him went out throughout the surrounding area. See, we have to take ownership of this church and we have to take ownership of this couple right here and say, this is my pastors. And until you do that and take them in and say they're yours, then you won't protect them like they're your own children. Can you imagine if you were in the grocery store in line, right? You're putting your groceries on there, minding your own business. All of a sudden, the people behind you start talking about your wife, talking about how ugly she is and she's this and that. And she's, you know, she's been around and you're it, it's only going to last about 10 seconds and it's going to get physical and it's going to get physical real fast. But how come when we're standing in that same grocery store and all of a sudden we hear people talking about our pastor or about our church, all of a sudden we clam up? Why? Because we didn't take ownership of it. We didn't say, God sent this man. God sent him into our lives on purpose. God sent this woman into our lives on purpose wasn't by accident. It was on purpose. We have to spread a news throughout this region about your pastor. Not about him as a man, about him as his anointing. Amen. What was Elisha chasing? The anointing. the anointing. How many of you, since you've known this couple, have had some kind of breakthrough in your life, either a healing breakthrough, a financial breakthrough, a, a spiritual breakthrough, a, a marriage breakthrough, breakthrough in your kids' lives. Just about everybody raised their hand. See, what, where were you at before they came? Some of you had some awesome, awesome testimonies before this man and woman came in into your life. Flip over to 1 Samuel chapter 16. See, to be true servants or true armor bearers or true church members, right? If we can say the word church member, I, I, I hate the word church member, but... If we can say the word church member in its proper context, which means you really do take ownership. To me, a church member is a church owner, meaning you own part of this whole thing, not monetary, but physically. 
See, I don't know about you in this church, but my church back home, I got blood there. Literally, I built half that place. I've shed blood there. I've shed a lot of sweat there. There's a lot of tears at that altar there that are mine, that are my family's, that are my wife's, that are my kids. I have ownership. I have real estate. There is a spot at the altar at our church and everybody knows who owns that piece of real estate. You're laughing, but I'm serious. There is a piece of, of real estate and during worship, you don't penetrate the Josh Barclay piece of real estate. Because if you do, it's about to get ugly. I mean, I move visitors and everything. I don't care who it is. Why? Because that's my spot. That's where I know God knows where I'm at. I know that God, if I stand in the right spot long enough, bless God, God's going to see me and God's going to do something because I'm right here. I'm not over here, God, and I'm not over here. I'm right here, service after service. Right? I can't miss it. God isn't going to miss me where I'm at. First Samuel, first Samuel, chapter 16 and verse 14. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful player of the harp. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand and the distressing spirit from God is upon you. You shall be well. Now, obviously, we know God wouldn't put a distressing spirit on you. That translation means that God did not remove it off of him. He let it on there. He, he just didn't remove it. So Saul said to his servants in verse 17, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the servants answered and said, look, I've seen a son of Jesse who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech and a handsome person. And the Lord is with him. Therefore, Saul sent messengers and said, send me your son, David, who is with the sheep. And they took a donkey, loaded it with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent him by his son, David, to Saul. So David came to Saul and stood before him and he loved him greatly and he became his armor bearer. Saul sent to Jesse saying, please let David stand before me for he has found favor in my sight. And so it was whenever the spirit from God was upon Saul that David would play the harp and Saul would become refreshed and well and the distressing spirit would depart from him. Now to me, being a true servant, being a true armor bearer or man or woman of God, this scripture is the most important scripture out of every scripture in the Bible. Because it just listed 10 things that we have to be to be true, godly servants. True, godly servants. One is skillful. He said, find me somebody that is skillful. We have, what does skillful mean? It means you're good at something, right? It means find something to do in the church and be good at it. See, in, my, in our ministry, I'm the number two guy. I'll never be number one. As long as Mark T. Barclay is alive, I'll be number two. But I will be the best at that. Nobody will be better than me. Nobody will take its place. I will be number one at being number two. I will do my best that nobody ever can be number one at being number two. That's my job. You're not going to take it. So find something in the church to do and be good at it. Number two is being a mighty man or woman of valor. Number three, a man or woman of war. I mean, you got to fight for this church. You got to fight for your pastor. 
Just like you would for your own family. You got to stand up and say, that's not right. You're not going to talk about my pastor. Now, these get harder as we go. So you got to be skillful. You got to be a mighty man or woman of valor, meaning you're full of courage and full of boldness. You got to be a man or woman of war, be able to go to battle if you need to. Man, this one's a toughie. It says in verse 18, you have to be prudent in speech. You got to think about what you say before you say it. That's prudent in speech. How many of your mouths got you in trouble? I should raise both hands. <laughs> yeah, we got to think about it, right? Number five, you got to be handsome and clean. <laughs> the clean part is even be more better than the, the handsome part. That's, that's Michigan talk, more better. <laughs> you got you to gotta be clean. If you sit down in a section and slowly by the end of worship, everybody has vacated from your section, there's something wrong. Okay? You got to brush your teeth. You got to look good, smell good. Number six, the Lord has to be with them or with you. The Lord has to be with you. He has to know who you are. He has to know that you're a child of God. He has to know that, that you walk with Jesus. These are the ten things to be a true servant. You have to be loved greatly. Verse 21 says, he stood before him and he was loved greatly. If your pastor isn't in love with you as a, as a good little sheep, you're not doing your job right. It isn't pastor, it's you. Haven't you seen some of the people the pastor loves? A lot of you shake your head and go, I don't know how pastor can do it. But pastor really does love them. Pastor, one of the things that I, it's, that I have battled in my life, I have watched so many people walk all over my father. Walk on him, do that. My dad's gone so many to great lengths to help preachers and people. And, and then, you know, a year later, they just turn on him and they do all this stuff. And my dad will still help him, will still fly to see him, will still send money. We've been sued and my dad still will love him and still send money. And I go, how can you do this? Why? Because there's something in there. There's something inside there as a pastor that says, I love them. They don't, they're, just, they're, they're just stupid in the proper term. They don't know better. They, they don't know better. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know that, that, that they're hurting their lives. Number eight, favor in his sight. So not only do you have to be loved by your pastor, you have to have favor with him. Now, how many of you are pastor's favorite? Well, that's a pretty good list. I mean, besides, yes, besides Miss Kathy. No, you have to be that. You have to find favor. How do you find favor? Let me give you a little little. A little hint here. You ready? You, you ready for the biggest hint ever on favor? Bless him. Bless him. You know, I love my kids and I love my kids no matter what they do when they get in trouble and when they don't. But man, do I love my kids, especially my little girl when she comes up out of the clear blue sky and just gives me a kiss or a hug or brings me a little note. Don't you think pastor's the same way? Can you imagine, you, you have enough people in this church. You, you have more than 52 people in this church, right? A lot more than that. So if you have at least 52 people, which we know you do, then there is no reason why 52 of you can't get together and do something small for your pastors every single Sunday. There should be a little something on Miss Kathy's seat, a little rose or a little flower or... Now listen, pastor's gleaming at me right now, so at least smile, okay? He's not happy, but you should be. 
He's not happy because he's humble. Because he doesn't want all that. But that's not right. That's not proper. Pastor, you got to let us bless you. You know, I remember a story about one of the armor bearers in our church about 20 something years ago. We, we had a little building pastor and outside we hadn't got enough money to to um, pave the part where pastor parked. You know, pastor said, let's pave where the handicap is and where the, the elderly people park. You know, when you're in a small church and you got 10, 15, 20 people or 50 people, you can't can't do everything. So. Where Pastor Park was just gravel. So he came in one time and he had, you know, a little dirt on his shoes. And so when he came in the back door where the pastor's office is and he came in, he put his Bible and stuff down. One of the ushers named Roger, good old Roger. Roger came in and he, he went just like this. Pastor was, was sitting down at his desk and Roger came in and he got down on his hands and knees and he started to polish, you know, with his bare hands, started to clean Pastor's shoe. And my dad went, you know, like, what are you doing? He said, listen, get up. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too good. I can clean my own shoes. And he stood up and stood over my father and tears came down his eyes. And he said, you have a job here. Don't you dare rob me from mine. You get to preach. I don't get to preach. You get to touch me from the message from Jesus Christ. I don't get to do that. You've got what's going to fix my marriage today. And believe me, I need it. So let me clean your shoe. Let me carry your Bible. Let me get you a glass of water. See, what he did is said there is I, he did the most amazing thing to me. And that is he said, I don't want you, pastor, thinking about little things. I want you thinking about stuff that I can do on my own. I don't want my man of God wondering if the stream is working or if the lights got on or if the worship team started on time or did we have everybody in the in the in the nursery and did the building get unlocked and did the AC get turned on? Is he capable of doing all of that? Absolutely he is. Probably better than all the rest of us. But if that's what he's focused on, then he is not focused on you. Now, these are fighting words for me and my man of God, and they should be for yours. Don't anybody dare stop my preacher on the way to the pulpit. I'll get, I'll get vicious about it. I'll tase you. Wait, I don't carry a taser. But if I did, I would tase you. You know why? Because that man of God came from his office all prayed up, all charged up. He's got a word from God and it isn't just for you. It's for me too. And if he's got a word for me, he's going to fix me. He's going to fix my life. He's going to fix my marriage or my kids or whatever it is that I need from him. Don't you dare for one second rob one bit of blessing that he has brought to this service for me. It's bad enough I got to share it with the rest of you. <laughs> Don't you dare rob from him. See, when, it, when it's honor, Dr. Barclay has a, has a saying, if honor is in you, honor will come out of you. Imagine how much better this man of God would preach if, if he got a message every day on his answer machine at home that says, Pastor, I don't need anything but to tell you I love you and I'm proud of you and Miss Kathy. He's going to. Hmm. Something inside of that. It's called being favor. Number nine is refreshed and well. When he would begin to do his ministry, David, the man of God became refreshed and well. That's what I was talking about. Leaving a little card for him. Give him a little, a little phone call. Buying him dinner and you're not there. I mean, I know buying him dinner and you're there is great. 
But buying them dinner and you're not there is even better. Right? Sending them out on a date. Because we've taken so much time, wouldn't it be nice if Pastor would just take Miss Kathy out on a date and you paid for it? Oh, what a blessing. You know what that means? That means they're going to sit there and talk about each other and they're going to pray for me. And that's exactly what I want. <laughs> right? How many times have, Pastor, uh, there's, uh, you're, you're one of them that have bought stuff for your pastor because you know. Buy your pastor a pen. Every time he reads it, he goes, man, that's, or uses it. He's like, man, that's a nice pen. I'm so glad so-and-so gave that to me. My dad does it all the time. When he puts a watch on that someone gave, gave him, he's like, man, that's a nice watch. Man, bless Daryl Baker for buying that for me. Man, if you're not going to do it for Bible reasons, do it for selfish reasons. <laughs> Get that blessing. You need a blessing. We need to be honored. We need that when he when is in your presence, that he is refreshed and well. Imagine that no matter what he went through in his personal life or all the junk he had to deal with with all the people that are out there talking about him and throwing stuff at him and emails and all of that to walk into a room where you're at and go, whoa, something's in there. Right. That's called refreshed and well. Right. How many of you sometimes when you get home, you're just like, ah. After a long day, doesn't it feel good? Do you know that you're home? You might have a hundred things to do at home, but that first 10 seconds into that house, you're just like, ah, right? Yeah. It's refreshing. It's well. That's the way your man of God needs to be. Sure, he can do stuff like shine his shoes and park his car and, and get water. But if we can do that and free him up to go pray... Go preach, pastor. Don't worry about that. I got that taken care of. Don't ever think about it again. See, that's the way we need to be to free him up to work on you. I mean, God gave us a man and woman to do nothing but work on all of our problems. There are spiritual mechanics. Every little teeny thing that's that's loose you know how a lot of you, if you have a brand new car, you kind of wait for four or five, six things to, to get wrong with it before you take it in. Not at church. We go in two or three times a week. We get everything tweaked and lubed up and ratcheted down and tightened up. And then we leave out perfect. And then three or four days out in the world, we got to come right back and pour a little more of this on us. Amen. But God gave us somebody to do that. To work on us. And number 10, the distressing spirit must depart from him. Must. If you're so anointed to do your job, the minute pastors around you, whatever is bugging him, that's what distressing is. This would be distressing to pastor if you just sit here and did this the whole service. He's going to turn on and smack you. <laughs> Right? Yes. Is this gonna, would you like that? No. No, it'd be distressing, wouldn't it? It would stress you out. So if you're that to him, that every time you come to church, pastor, hey, pastor, hey, pastor, 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 I need this. Pastor, you prayed for me last service, but it didn't work. Pray for me again. Huh? That's not refreshing. That's distressing. Now, of course, pastor wants to pray for you. Don't take this out of context. I see some of you looking at me like, well, now pastor can't pray for me. <laughs> no, no, no. He, that's what they're here for. And look at him. He wants to pray for you. He wants to take care of you. But imagine that after he's doing all of that for you, that you do something back to him. How much better he'd preach. How much bigger he'd stand up knowing that you're behind him, that you believe in him, that you love him. Come on, he's looking at me really bad right now. At least say an amen or something. Amen. Preaching to Josh. Thank you. Amen. We got to get to that spot 
where we got to quit blaming everything on this man and woman right here and blame ourselves. Come on, I'm, I'm one of you. I'm not the pastor. I just told you I'm the number two guy. I'm not, I'm not in this position. I don't want to be in this position. I love people, but I don't love anybody enough to pastor them. <laughs> just telling you right now. <laughs> right? I don't want that job. I don't have what it takes to be that job, and neither do you. You want to mess with all your problems? No. Take your problems and everybody else's problems in the church and lay them at this person's feet, and that's what he does. What a great job. So why not do these things right here to help boost him to be a true man or woman of God, to have a real pastor in their life? You have to be skillful, mighty man or woman of valor, meaning courage or boldness, a man or woman of war. You have to be prudent in speech. You have to be handsome and clean. The Lord must be with you. You have to be loved greatly by him. You have to have find favor in their sight. You have to be, he has to be, or they have to be refreshed and well in your presence. In your presence. That's some big shoulders to fill there. And ten, any distressing spirits must depart from them. That's a hard list right there, people. That right there, if we follow those things, you watch God bless your life. You watch him just turn your life upside down and just give you every blessing you've ever had. To get a blessing, you have to be a blessing. You know, the Bible says, give and you shall receive. Imagine if we started giving into this couple's life. And I don't, don't look at me like I'm talking about money. I mean, money is good. Miss Kathy likes money. She doesn't love it. Well, she might love it, but she's not in love with it. But I mean, imagine just blessing them, right? With a note or a phone call, not the kind. Now, there are going to be times that you've got to call them and, and it's not going to be fun. It's not going to be, a, it's a, I need help, pastor. Right? My, my house has had water issues at least a dozen times in the last six years. Now, thank God, one of my really good friends is a water restoration man. But we have a running joke because it seems like every time I call him, it's because I have water somewhere in my house. So he literally picks up the phone. It doesn't matter if I'm calling him to say I just saw him or I got something for him. He picks it up and says, tell me there's not water in your house. <laughs> or he'll pick it up and say, tell me this is a personal call, not a business call. And I'll either say, nope, I got something for you. I'll be like, well, and he's like, I'm on my way over. Right? So there are those times that you got to call pastor and say, pastor, I need you. But I'm telling you, just like my friend, he likes it when I call him up and say, hey, I got this for you. I made you something. I picked you up a coffee to bless you. We got a guy in the church that found out Mrs. B drinks a certain drink on Sunday morning. Every single Sunday morning, he lives 20 something miles away from the, the church. He drives 20-something miles into Starbucks, buys a Starbucks, and drops that drink off at my, uh, my parents' house two hours before church starts because he knows that she's got to take her, her vitamins and all that with this because of her surgery and stuff. She has to do all that. And then he goes either back home to get his wife or he'll go to the church every single Sunday. Why? Because he's not dumb. <laughs> he knows the blessing. He knows the blessing that he's getting in return because he's taking care of the woman of God. He's planting that seed for his woman. And see, that's the way we got to be. 
We got to be, we got to get to the point where the man of God isn't about him. It isn't about what he wears or, or this right here. It's about this anointing right here. They have something that we don't have. They have something to fix us, to, to, to deliver us, to get us out of everything. It's called anointing. Just like just like Elisha chase after Elijah, that's what we need to do. Constantly saying, Pastor, touch me. Pastor, lay hands on me. I need that. But better yet, we're just draw. This is what we do every single service. I'm taking it all, Pastor. I want it. I'm drawing on you. I believe in you. You got something. You were on your face before God. And if every single one of you get to that spot, just like Roger... He said, listen, get, get everything. The minute you get here, Pastor, you get every little thing off your mind. Because I'm here. I'm here. There's no reason why they, can't, they shouldn't get something every service. There's no reason. No reason why they shouldn't get a little note that says, I love you, or a phone call, or, or whatever. You know what your pastor's like. I don't know what they like, but you know what they like. You know what blesses them. You know what honors them. On their birthdays, they should have something presented to them. Or an offering taken up or a gift for them. Not because, not because they're important and because they're, they're people, but because in your life, they're important. And without them, where are you going to be? It's called honor. You honor the anointing by honoring the man. You honor the woman, you get anointing out of them. You give in to them, they give in to you. But what you're giving in to them is little compared to what they're giving in to you. Bow your heads with me, Father. Help what was said tonight to be sealed and seared into our hearts. Not as just some young punk preacher hollering at us, but yet a word from God that came on purpose to help us to take care of our man and woman of God, to protect that anointing that they carry, to guide us, to fix us, and to help us. Make us honorable servants in your house. Make us true men and women of God that stand behind our pastor and fight. Father, anoint us to be better Christians, to go out into all the world and preach the gospel, to fill this house. Not because we want rear ends and chairs, Lord, but because we want souls in heaven. We want souls to come in and help us win more souls. None of these things will move us, Jesus. For we will count ourselves dear to ourselves. That we will finish this race with joy. Anoint us tonight to be a blessing not only to each other but to find ways to bless our man and woman of God. To bless them so that they can think about blessing us. To take things off, burdens off of their lives and off their shoulders and weights off of them, the things that we can do to lighten their load so that they can get on their face before God. And we thank you for that and we praise you for that. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. This concludes another message from the ministry of Rev. Daryl Baker, pastor of Christian Faith Fellowship. If you would like to find out more about us or contact Pastor Baker to have him as a guest speaker, just visit us on the web at cffchurch.com. That's cffchurch.com. You will also find many great resources that will help you further your walk with God. You can also contact our ministry by phone at 817-491-0624. That's 817 Four nine one zero six two four.